at the end of last chapter, the Lord had agreed to allow Moses not to see the totality of his, the Lord's splendor, but just to see his back. And if you remember, he'd given the instruction to Moses of how that was going to happen. I'm going to play, tell you a, a spot on a rock, and I want you to go stand there. I'm going to come pick you up. I'm going to put you in a hole in the, in the, in the, in the mountain. I'm going to put palm of my hand behind in front of the rock. When I pass by, I'm going to remove the palm of my hand, and you'll be able to see my back, because that's all that you can stand. Because as humans, I did not create you with the ability to see the full glory of the Lord and live. You will have to die to see the full glory of the Lord. Well, now as we pick up, we find out that um, the Lord is just about ready to do that, except He's got one little small task for Moses to do before he allows him to see the glory of the Lord. It says, Now the Lord said to Moses, Cut out for yourself two stone tablets like the former ones, and I will write on the tablets the words that were on the former tablets which you shattered. So be ready by morning. He's given him a lot of time, isn't he? Be ready by morning and come up in the morning to Mount Sinai and present yourself there to me on the top of the mountain. And no man is to come up with you, nor let any man be seen anywhere on the mountain. Even the flocks and the herds may not graze in front of that mountain. Now, if you remember, actually, Moses is still on the mountain here, by the way. He has not gone down the mountain. He's going to have to go down the mountain, cut out the stones, and come back up. Now, I want to remind you, Moses is 80 years old, and he's climbing mountains. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not quite 80 yet. But just going up three steps is sometimes a little difficult. And Moses is climbing mountains. So Moses is going to go down the mountain and maybe not all the way down to the campsite. Maybe just a little ways down. And the reason why he's got to go down and to carve out some two tablets of stone and how big are these tablets of stone? Were they going to fit inside the Ark of the Covenant? So I'm just going to give you a guesstimation on the ark. I can draw it for you. I know the inches. But just so you see it, the tablets are going to be no longer than this. Because of the Ark of the Covenant, it's about this long. They're going to be no wider than this. Because the Ark of the Covenant is about this wide. And so these are going to be stones that are going to be, there's going to be two of them, and they're going to be an adequate size for Moses to carry. They actually may be this size by this size, or they may be square, or they may, we do not know what they look like. We have no record. We have pictures of what some artist drew that you have looked at all your life when you look through all, especially the old Bibles. You remember the old Bibles that ever so often had this gorgeous full color picture stuck into it, and, and it was a brand new Bible, that, but the picture looked like it was 300 years old already? which it probably was a reproduction of a 300-year-old picture written, drawn by some fabulous artist of the past. But those were artist conceptions. We don't know what they look like. But Moses is going to go down. He's going to have to cut them out. Why does he have to cut them out? Well, if you remember in last week's lesson, last chapter... The Lord said to Moses, now listen, I've told you what I need to tell you. The 40 days and 40 nights are up. You've written everything down. I need you to go down into the, into the camp because I hear a ruckus going on in, down in the camp. And Moses turns around and says, Lord, I, I know that you, you've said that there are an obstinate people and there's a ruckus going on down there that, and, and, and you're upset with them. But Lord, you know, don't be so hard on these people because, you know, they're really good people that six months ago, in the last six months, I've went down to Egypt and led them out with your help. These good people. These good people. And the Lord doesn't say anything to Moses. And so Moses goes down the mountain at the end of the 40 days and he gets down there and he sees them calf of gold that 
Lord's already told Moses they made. And, and it, it just flat made Moses mad. And what did he do? He threw the tablets and shattered them. So the Lord's saying, okay, I gave, I gave those to you. And I tell you what, I cut those out and I carved them to begin with. And now I'm going to let you cut two out. And I will write with my finger again on those tablets. So when Moses gets the tablets completed, the Lord is going to promise to use his finger again to write the Ten Commandments just as he had on the previous set. Looking ahead, it's kind of interesting. I have to ask a question. Why did the Lord send Moses down the mountain to cut them out when he's on a mountain where there's rocks all around? And I think I know the reason. It's all speculation, but I think I know the reason. Because when we look ahead into God's Word, 400, almost 500 years, Solomon is going to be building the, the temple. And when he builds the temple, it's going to be, that temple is going to be about the size of this room. Just understand that. About the size of this room that we are in now. It's going to have stone walls. It's going to have wood that's cut out for the joist across the ceiling. It will then be covered. Uh... It will be beautiful, but the instruction for the Lord was that on that holy mount, when that temple is being made, not one hammer hit is to be heard, not one cut of the saw or of the axe or of the chisels or of the sewing or any noise is to go on on the holy mount when that temple is being built. So the wood is going to come from the cedars of Lebanon, the king of Tyre, which is, the king of Tyre is mentioned many times in the scripture, and he's not ex exactly a great king, by the way, but he's made an arrangement with Solomon, and one of those arrangements is because there's been a marriage between the daughter of Tyre and King Solomon. So there's arrangements for this cedars of Lebanon to be cut for all the wood structures on the temple. And so that's done in one place. And over at the stone quarry, everything is cut over there. And everything is brought in in total silence to build the temple. Not only with the first building of the temple, but also in the days of Ezra and Nehemiah, when the second temple is being built, the same regulations are in place for the reconstruction of the temple. It is my proposition at this point and proposal that the Lord wanted Moses to go down underneath the cloud that the Lord was in and radiating from, down Mount Sinai far enough that he could go down outside of the earshot of where the Lord was, although the Lord hears everything, but down outside the cloud that covered the mountain, he is able to be seen by the people in the camp that there's Moses. Oh, we see Moses. But none of them are to be allowed to come back up. And in fact, none of the animals are allowed from the herds are allowed to come up either on the mountain. And Moses was to go down just far enough to go and get, um, and to get what he will make as two more stones for the Ten Commandments to be on. I have to ask another question. What does he use to chisel the stones? Does he take with him the copper chisels or the iron chisels that they have? Or uh, does he take along with him the string? You know, when they cut stone in those days, they would use it with rope that they had made and water. And they would use the water as the liquid and they'd use the rope to cut it and they'd make an indention and then they would take a, 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 a chisel and put into that slit that they had cut and they'd use a hammer of some sort to hammer it to shatter the rock to break it open. Nothing new today. Nothing new today. Whenever we go to 
a cemetery and we see the stones that are cut there that are standing as monuments, those stones were cut in a similar way. Those stones were cut by a small hole being drilled about yay far down in a series of holes uh, along the granite where they wanted the thickness to be. Or with slate, slate does it easier. Flax slate, you can do it with a wood with a wood um, a wedge. Um, with granite, you have to do it with something a little harder. They would take with the granite, they'll take and put the um, little metal pegs in there, and they'll come along with uh, sledgehammers, 10-pound uh, sledgehammers, and they'll beat these things, these little wedges, metal wedges across. And the next thing you know is the granite piece of piece of granite begins to fall and it falls off. They will then take that, load it on the truck, go in, and from there they'll use saws. But we don't know what Moses had. We do not know what these tablets were made out of. Were they slate? Were they granite? Was it made out of sandstone? What is there? If it's the mountain that we think it's the mountain is, that where the Mount of Sinai is, there in the area of the Midianites, it's a granite mountain. But we don't know. We just don't know. So, verse 4 says, So he cut the two stones like the former ones, and Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took the two stone tablets in his hand. So he did the job. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood there with him as he called upon the name of the Lord. Stop. He calls upon the name of the Lord. That is not a new saying there. But the first time we saw this before this is with Adam's son, Seth. Adam and Eve had two sons by the name of Cain and Abel. As you remember, Cain killed Abel. The next son that was born was named Seth. Cain is old enough that by the time Seth becomes old enough to, have, to take a wife and have children, Cain already has children. In fact, Cain has already gone out to the east of the campsite of Abraham to go out. It's called the land of Nob, if you remember in your scripture. And the land, word Nob means to the east of. He's gone out to the east of the family and Cain has already begun his family. Whenever Seth is 130 years old, he has a son by the name of Enos. And at the birth of the child of Enos, Seth and all the rest of the godly line of Adam, not of Cain, but of Adam, begin to call upon the name of the Lord. And so there you see it. There is nothing different from that day to this. You who are godly will call upon the name of the Lord. And to call upon him. Going on, look here, it says in verse 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. So here it happened. Moses is back up on the mountain. He's got the two tablets that are not written on yet. He's standing in the place where Moses told him to go stand on the flat part of the rock. The Lord comes by. He picks Moses up with the, probably the two tablets in his hand, puts him in the hole in the rock, puts his palm against the hole, passes by, and allows Moses to see his back, the splendor of the glory of the Lord, just from the back as the Lord passes by. Verse 6 and 7 then tell us what the Lord says to Moses about his nature, about his the attributes of his divine nature. If you're reading an English translation like we are in here, when you see the capital letters L-O-R-D, the word Lord, if you're reading in Hebrew, that's the word Jehovah. For some reason, and I do not know why, uh, I do not know really why, I've heard answers, but they do not satisfy me. Whenever Coverdale and Tyndall 
and Wycliffe were all making the first English translations, there was some reason why they started using the word LORD in all caps as opposed to using the word Jehovah. I think it has something to do with Muslims. I do not know for a fact, but that's what I believe, because at the same time, Tyndall, Wycliffe, Coverdale, Matthews, and all of those uh, are looking, um, are making the first English translations. The Catholic Church is having a dickens of a time over in, in the Catholic world because the Muslims are attacking Constantinople, and they're trying to take that capital. And the Holy Roman Empire has divided itself into two legs, by the way, an eastern part and a western part. The eastern part, the capital is Rome. The western part is what you know from your, um, your education in school called the Byzantine Empire. It is capital was Constantinople. Sixteen campaigns are being thrown against the Catholic Church to take Constantinople, who, by the way, had taken uh, huge chains with chains as big as I am, loops of chains as big as I am, and they had crossed the channel with those chains. And how in the world they handled them back in those days without uh, modern hydraulic means I have no way of knowing it was all by brute power just moving those chains the ships of the Muslims were not able to come into the channel and therefore they were able to keep them out and they were not able to take Constantinople but finally on the 16th campaign the Muslims took that capital and turned the great St. John's Catholic Church in Constantinople into the mosque that is standing there today you can still see that church standing all these years at that point in time the catholic church could not fight the two battles that were going on it had to choose do we fight the battle of islam or do we fight the battle of these uh, these renegade rebellious theologians by the names of things like john calvin and martin luther and swingley and because martin luther and john calvin and all of them at that point in time who were rebelling and were trying to clean up the catholic church were trying to clean it up and stay within it the catholic church made the decision to fight the muslims instead and they lost that battle in fact, they lost the Byzantine Empire when they lost the capital of Constantinople. They changed the name of Constantinople into Istanbul, and you know the rest of the story. The Catholic, that leg of the Catholic Church would soon fall, and both with the other. The west eastern leg had all already fallen in 476. Constantinople was taken in 14. Uh, 53, a thousand years later, and it fell. Therefore, the two legs of Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the statue of gold was complete. The head was complete, the breast was complete, the belly was complete, the waist was complete, the thighs were complete, they had fallen, and lo and behold, in the infinite wisdom of both sides as the, as the two sides of the Holy Roman Empire had fallen in the infinite wisdom of the capture of those two sides they divided each side into five states or five countries in 476 when the Germanic people took over the Eastern Empire they decided to make five toes out of that state out of that country Britain France Italy Spain in North Africa. 1,000 years later, when Constantinople fell, and all was lost there, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Roman Empire, was divided by the Muslims into five countries. Macedonia, Greece, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt. And so Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the ten toes had been completed except for the part where they have to rejoin back together. And they have not rejoined back together. The next big thing in prophecy, if you want to know, that you need to be looking for, because the Lord will not return 
to snatch his church away until Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the prophecy is fulfilled. We're looking for Britain, France, Spain, Italy, North Africa, Greece, Macedonia, Syria, Turkey, and Egypt to reunite as one country with one leader. And by the way, when he finally gets in power, he will be blind in one eye. That's how you know when the dream of Nebuchadnezzar has been fulfilled. And it has not been fulfilled yet. Not yet. That's the next big thing that has to happen in prophecy. After that happens, then we have a whole plethora of things in prophecy that must be fulfilled. Well, with that, we go back to our scripture here. For some reason, at the time when Constantinople fell and the English translations are being made, they decided to use the word Lord so they would not offend the Muslims by saying the name of God in their language, which was Jehovah. If you happen to be Spanish and you read Spanish, you are fortunate because in your Bible, they do not use the word for Lord. They use the word Jehovah in the Spanish Bible and in many of the other translations. But for all practical purposes, the Muslims are not worried about the Spaniards. The Muslims are not worried about the rest of the world. The Muslims are worried about defeating the English-speaking world. And if you do not believe that, just turn on your news. It's where we are. And I will tell you this. Going into World War I, the Muslims controlled 50% of Europe at that time. All the nations of Europe, including Moscow, <coughs> Russia, and the rest of the European nations were so under the control of Islam that had something not occurred, Islam would already be the national law of those countries. <clears throat> but World War I came along, and the grand imam of Islam decided to side with the Germans in World War I. And when World War I was over, Islam was no longer in control because the British and the Americans and the Allies were in control. That set up for us to take Israel out of the hands of the Muslims, to take Turkey out of the hands of the Muslims to take Yugoslavia and Macedonia and Greece and all out of the hands of the Muslims. <clears throat> and we did so. Now, the Muslims are trying to take it back over. In fact, I believe in France, they are within two votes of turning the law in France into Sharia law. That is how close it is. The issue with that is they may have burned their bridge with the attack that happened there in France, of which my friend sitting right here was there in that city when it happened. And it rise. He, he had flown an airplane over there to take uh, his boss over there, and uh, where the truck was run into all the people, if you remember that, and they had to do that. He was right there, right there. Norm was right there. With missed it by about 10 minutes. That was a wake-up call to um, France. Well, with that, that just tells you this. You may think it is close, but until you see the ten toes come back together, it's just close. It's not here yet. It's not. Well, because they use the word Lord instead of words Jehovah, it sometimes throws us off. Please don't let it throw you off. That Jehovah is the same Jehovah that will come in the form of a babe and wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, who will die on the cross for you. That's Jehovah. That's the Lord. The Lord of the Old Testament is the Lord of the New Testament. And so here he, says, he calls himself the Lord God. The word God is the word El, E-L. <clears throat> and that means strong and mighty. So when you hear the word, he is the Lord God, he is the Lord God, that means he is the Jehovah, strong and mighty. 
He says he's compassionate. That's the word that means he's a merciful being who is full of tenderness. The word gracious that he calls himself means that he is a loving God, full of kindness, full of goodness. The fourth is that he's slow to anger. That's actually two words, which means that he is not easily irritated and that in kindness he waits a long time before he reacts, unlike almost everybody in this room. Do not raise your hands. There are very few of, there are a couple of y'all that react slowly to things, but you're not as slow as the Lord is. Because you don't know the future, He does. Therefore, He knows when to be slow and He knows when to react fast. And He's slow in His anger, abounding in loving kindness. That means He's a, abounding in His beneficence. He is abounding in truth. That means He cannot be deceived. He cannot deceive either. That all, he, he is the all the source of wisdom and knowledge. Actually, the word truth there should be translated that he's abounding in faithfulness. That means he's trustworthy in everything. He keeps loving kindness for the thousands. That's two Hebrew words that means he is the bountiful keeper of mercy for thousands of generations. Those until the, as long as the world endures. I love this because he says the Lord forgives iniquity, transgressions, and sins. It's three different words. Forgiveness means to bear, to lift, to carry away, to take away. Iniquity means guilt. The Lord forgives guilt. Transgression means a rebellious act. The Lord forgives the rebellion of sin, which means offenses. So the Lord even forgives offenses. And therefore, we want you to know that the Lord is the Redeemer. He is the Pardoner. He is the Forgiver. And He is the only one that can forgive those things. You cannot. The ninth one says the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. You notice the word the guilty is in italics. That means it's not in the original. Actually, we look at the word unpunished and it means acquitted. It means that a better translation of this would be the Lord will by no means leave the guilt, let the guilty go free, in other words. Uh, he's not, he's going to punish that person no matter how, what you've done. You're not going to get away with it. Punishment is going to come. And finally, the Lord expresses to Moses that he will visit the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Now, don't forget, the iniquity he's talking about is the guilt. The guilt of an act. I want to remind you that passing on the guilt of an act does not mean that he has passed on the sin of the act. Just because one of your ancestors committed a horrible crime or a horrible act of sin does not mean that you are going to commit that sin. He's talking about the guilt of it being passed down. Here's an example. There's now a family over close to San Antonio who will never, ever, in the next four or five generations, be able to shed from them, them the guilt of what their son did in a Baptist church. You catching the drift? You got it? Is that a good example? It will go down. It will go down. I can make it simpler than that to where, let's say, you're back in uh, high school. And you did something in high school. And 40 years later, you're standing at your 40th anniversary with your kids and your grandkids. And some smart aleck classmate of yours comes up and says, remember when you got in trouble for? Because all they remember is what you got in trouble for. They don't remember all the good that you did. You follow me? The guilt of it passes down. Now, in the society of which the Lord is setting up Moses and the Israelites, He's setting them up. They're out there in the wilderness. They're in a camp here. Here's the Benjamites. Here's the descendants of Judah. Here's the descendants of Levi. They can't go anywhere. They're there for 40 years. Now, they don't know they're there for 40 years yet. That's going to come later. But they're going to be there for 40 years. And then when they do move into the promised land, here's the section for all the descendants of Benjamin to live. And here's the section right across here, part right here, where all the descendants of Judah are to live. They're living in tribal areas. 
these tribal areas are smaller than Houston. Forget that. These tribal areas are smaller than a quarter of Houston. It's small landmass. Not much bigger. Each one of them is not much bigger than the land of the area we call Clear Lake. And, you're grow and generation after generation after generation is growing up in Clear Lake or in Benjamin land. And one of your ancestors does something really hideous and terrible. That guilt of what he did passes on to you. Oh, you're the grandchild of so and so. And if they don't say it to your face, I guarantee you, they say it behind your back. Enough of that? You understand that? That's what the Lord is talking about here. It's the nature of it. And all of, all of us know, all of us know, that sometimes the only way you can get out from underneath the get, guilt of one of your ancestors is to pack up your bags and move someplace else. But then... In the climate that you live in today in this world, they catch up with you on Facebook. <laughs> or they catch up with you on Twitter. Or somebody sticks a microphone in front of your face. And they go, looky there. I knew him when he was in high school. You know what he did? And it's told. It's told. <laughs> over it's basically roasting somebody, that's right, except it's word. And so what the Lord is actually saying to that is, He's saying to the people, don't be guilty of sins. So Moses bows down, and the Lord made, and Moses made haste and bowed low before the, towards the earth and worshiped, and, and he said, because he's seen the glory of the Lord already, the back of the Lord and he says if now if I have found favor in your sight in other words I know that I have found favor in your sight I know that Lord so he says oh Lord I, I pray let let the Lord go along in our midst uh, where we go and where we travel you always go with us because the Lord has already told Moses that he is not going to go up to the promised land the first time when they're going to try to he's going to allow them to get to the border of the promised land and they're going to send 12 spies out we know that's what's going to happen because we can read ahead and the Lord has said I'm not going with you there I'm going to send an angel to go ahead of you, but I'm not going because if I go, I am going to be really mad. And of course, you know the Lord went. He's everywhere in the presence. But he was not going to be where the people could see him there and he was not going to react to them. They're going to go up there. They're going to send the 12 spies out. 12 spies are going to come back. Says, oh, it's a land flowing with milk and money, but there's so many people. It's just as if they've got giants in the land. We just, we can't overpower them. There's just way more of them than there is of us. And the people vote, no, we're not going to go in right in the promised land. They go in this direction. They go to bed. They wake up the next morning and say, well, we think we changed our mind. I think we will go. And the Lord says, no, tell Moses, Moses, tell them that no, they're not. They're going to go back to Mount Sinai. The reason why that punishment's going to come is not because of the vote. It's because of the molten calf. The Lord made the decision that that group of folks, 20 years and older, would not go into the promised land because of the molten calf in last week's lesson in chapter 33. It just so happens that they're going to find out more about being a stubborn and obstinate people whenever they get to that place ready to go in. They're going to get to see what the promised land looked like, but never get to taste of the promised land unless they were 20 years or younger. And that's going to be 40 years later when the 20-year-old is 60. The 15-year-old 15 is 55. The one-year-old is 40. And all their kids and everyone that's been born out in the wilderness, they will get to go into the promised land, but no one 20 years and over. And then God said, Behold, I'm going to make a covenant. Here's the first sign in the Bible of the Mosaic covenant. This is it. Before all the people, I will perform miracles which have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations. And all the people among you will live, uh, who you, whom you live, will see the working of the Lord, 
For it is a fearful thing that I am going to perform with the Israelites? With you. He's talking to Moses. Huh. And it's going to be fearful. What's more fearful than the Passover death angel in Egypt? What's more fearful than being at the edge of the sands of the seashore, locked in by mountains, and Pharaoh is coming down with his 600 chariots and men and all their soldiers with swords and weapons, and you have nothing but donkeys and cows and fishing poles and earrings. What's more fearful than seeing the Red Sea open a 15-mile trek across the Red Sea with water up more than a mile high on either side of you, don't you think that would be a little fearful? I think it would. Something else is going to be more fearful from than that that the Lord is going to do? Oh, I'm going to stay tuned for that. Then he says about this covenant, be sure to observe what I am commanding you this day. What are those commandments? Here it is. Behold, I'm going to drive out the Amorites before you and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Watch yourself that you make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land into which you are going, lest it become a snare in your midst. Well, let me just tell you a little secret. All those tribes right there are descendants of Canaan, the grandson of Noah, who Noah cursed whenever he woke up from his drunken stupor. You remember that story? Good. And so the problem with this, these Canaanites worship a very ungodly goddess, God, and other gods that are false gods. And the Lord says to Moses, make sure you don't make any covenant agreements or anything with these people when you go up there. Okay, verse 13. But rather... You're to tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars and cut down their ashram. For you shall not worship any other God. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Lest you make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and play the harlot with their gods and sacrifice to their gods. And someone invites you to eat of his sacrifice. And you take some of the daughters for your sons. And his daughters place the harlots with their gods. And cause your sons to also play the harlot with their gods. So there we see something that's very interesting. The Mosaic Covenant says, hey, you are not to do anything that has to do with their worship. In fact, you are to tear down all their worship places. You're to tear them down, all their signs of worship, all their religious articles, everything they have. And especially tear down Asherim. Well, who is Asherim? Asherim is the Phoenician goddess of the Canaanites worshipped as an, Im with, as an image of her. She was also called the Lady of the Sea in literature from 14 B century B.C. By the way, that's the time of the Exodus, near the time of the Exodus story. <clears throat> the name is found in the Ras Shamra epic discovered in 1937. We knew about this name. We knew about this because of the Bible. But it wasn't until we found carved in stone, by the way, an epic on a stone about this goddess that we knew about. It, and that was found in uh, uh, archaeology 19. She was the goddess of Tyre, pictured often by the side of Baal. Prophets are of, of her are mentioned in 1 Kings 18, along with utensils used in her worship, which is found in 1 Kings 23. Her cult was utterly detestable to the Lord, 1 Kings chapter 15. Other names of this goddess that we know are Ashtoreth, Ashtar, from which we get Ishtar, from which we get Easter. Her image is most often represented as a nude woman riding on a lion with a lily in one hand and a serpent in the other, and she is called in the manuscript the holiness or the holy one. English interpretations of the statues has this name, Kuchi. Male prostitutes consecrated themselves to her, and in her honor they were called Kushnims, which is properly translated in the English as Sodomites. The lily symbolized grace and sex appeal. The serpent represented, uh, represents fertility. 
She, her specialties are sex and war. Her shrines were temples of legalized sexual immorality. In a fragment of the Baal epic, epic, which is another stone that has it carved in stone, she slaughters mankind and wades through the bloody onslaught up to her throat while laughing joyously. No wonder. No wonder the Lord says at the end of this passage, don't allow any of your sons to take their daughters in marriage. Do not allow the daughters to take your sons in marriage because what will happen is they will start being lured into the worship of these gods. Solomon never learned the lesson because he had many of these wives that worship these gods. And in fact, lo and behold, Solomon allowed these gods, Asherim, Molech, and others, to have their images placed inside the temple that he built for the Lord. Now, I want you to understand what we're saying here. David was allowed to design the temple of the Lord before he even arrived in Jerusalem. He was still living in Hebron, by the way. He arrives in Jerusalem and he cannot, he cannot build the temple because he has too much blood on his hands. The blood that is on his hands is the blood of his wife's ex-husband that he had killed, Uriah. Solomon stole the wife of Uriah. Stolen. And then he lied about what had happened. And then he plotted, he connived to have Uriah killed in battle. David, I'm sorry, David. Have David Uri killed in battle. You got it. Sorry, you got it. All right. That's the reason why David was not allowed to build the temple. Solomon, on the other hand, on the first day of the 480th year since the children of Israel left Egypt, David sets up to begin building the temple. 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. It's the fourth year of his reign. It's the 480th year since the anniversary date that they left. Therefore, it is Abed the 15th is when it is. It's going to take... Solomon, four years basically to build the temple of his 40-year reign as king. It takes him 13 years to build his palace, by the way, which was grander than the temple. But that's okay. And then, lo and behold, Solomon has already taken wives because he can't build this temple without entering into marriages with the people around in the countries where he needs the stone and he needs the wood. So he starts marrying wives to be friends with the king of Tyre, by the way, and others. And, of course, what comes along with the wives? Their jewelry and their outfits and their gods. And the temple is no sooner dedicated and put into use then Solomon starts allowing, oh yeah, my wife has a God. You know how it is. Oh, you know, he's the king. He's, you know, you know. Uh, the priest says to Solomon, you know, we, that's, a, that's a graven image. We can't. Priest, you know, I'm the king around here and I, I built that temple. So I, I, I want that. Go ahead. It, it, it's just a little thing. It, it won't hurt. It's, it'll be okay. It's not okay. In fact, the future of the kingdom of Israel will be divided into ten parts to the north and two parts to the south. The two parts to the south is where the temple is, by the way. And it's all because of what Solomon does. But only because of his love for David, the Lord will not divide the kingdom, according to Scripture, when Solomon is the king. He'll wait till Solomon is dead for about two months when Jeroboam is brought back from Egypt, who's already been anointed the next king of the northern ten tribes about three years before the death of Solomon. And Rehoboam is such a fool, the only child of Solomon is such a fool, that whenever the northern king tribes come to us and say, listen, your father did some things and... We want to know if you're going to continue to do business the same way. And if you continue to do business the same way, the northern ten tribes are going to split off. To which Rehoboam says, My little finger is stronger than the waist of my father. I will be worse than him. And he was. 
And he was. So lo and behold, the Lord says on to Moses as they're up on the mountain, he says, I want to tell you some things. I want to tell you some more things. I want to tell you the rest of the things that commands. You shall not make for yourselves no molten gods. I wonder why. You shall observe the feast of the unleavened bread for seven days. You shall eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month of Abed. For in the month of Abed, you came out of Egypt. The first offspring of every womb belongs to me and all your male livestock and the first offspring from your cattle and your sheep. And you shall redeem with a lamb the first offspring of a donkey. And if you do not redeem it, you shall break its neck. You shall redeem the firstborn of your sons and none shall appear me before me empty handed you shall work six days but on the seventh day you shall rest even during plowing time and harvest you shall rest and you shall celebrate the feast of weeks that is the first fruits of the wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the turn of the year three times a year all your males are to appear before the Lord God the Lord Almighty uh, and the God, of Is the God of Israel. For I will drive out nations before you in larger borders, and no man shall covet your land when you go up three times a year to appear before the Lord your God. You shall not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread, nor is the sacrifice of the feast of Passover to be left over until morning. You shall bring the first, very first, of the first fruits of your soil into the house of the Lord your God. You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. That's the third through the twelfth commands that are given in the Mosaic Code. If you want to know more about those, if you will remember, we took several weeks to discuss each of those in lessons 21 through 23. Go get those if you need them. We have them in the cabinet if you'd like to take a copy home with you. Then the Lord says to Moses, write down these words, for in accordance with these words I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. For the second time the Lord says, write these things down. The first time he was on the mountain for 40 days, the Lord says in chapter 17, write this stuff down, and Moses did. And now he says to Moses, write this down again, and Moses will. And so... He was there with the Lord for 40 days and 40 nights, and he did not eat bread or drink water. And he wrote on the tablet the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. I was talking about the Lord doing that. So Moses is there. And so I look at this and I think, huh, 40 days and 40 nights. It was his second 40-day visit to the mountain. Okay. But this time he stayed the entire time without food and water. So here I have to ask the question, because I wondered, did he not eat or drink? Uh, we don't know that answer. Was Moses aware of the days and the nights while he was in the presence of the Lord on the mountain? Don't know if he knew that. Did, he, did time just fly, in other words? Was Moses aware of the passing of time? Did Moses sleep, or was he awake for the entire time of 40 days? Oh, I don't know. Uh, um, did Moses have no concern for food or water? We're wondering. Did Moses intentionally not eat or drink while he was on the mountain? The answer to these questions, we don't know. It's just speculation. But Moses did not eat and he did not drink for that 40 days and 40 nights. And it came about when Moses was coming down from Mount Sinai. And you see that part that's in parentheses. That means some well-meaning author has gone over and grabbed that and brought that thought from another passage. So it was coming down from Mount Sinai that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because of his speaking with him, him being the Lord. Hmm. That's interesting that's written like that because that brings me to back to the point of wondering, did Moses write this down or did Joshua write it down? Whoever wrote it down, I'm not concerned with that because I believe it's part of the word of the Lord, inspired by the word of the Lord. But what it's saying is that Moses did not realize. Moses is not speaking in first person here or third person or whatever. Moses didn't know this, okay? He didn't know that something was different about him. So when Aaron and all the sons of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. Huh. Let me just go back. Back in chapter 34, verse 10, it says, 
I will perform miracles that have not been produced in all the earth, nor among any of the nations. And all the people among whom you live will see the working of the Lord, for it is a fearful thing, same word as used in the other passage, that I am going to perform with the Israelites, no, with you. And so here we see the people are looking at Moses and what's going on with his face that is shining and they are fearful. They are afraid. So much afraid that when Moses had, then Moses had to call to them and Aaron and all the rulers in the congregation returned to him and Moses spoke to them and afterwards all the sons of Israel came near and he commanded them to do everything that the Lord had spoken to him on Mount Sinai. They're afraid of this reflection of the glory of the divine nature of God that is radiating off the face of Moses. It doesn't look natural. I am sure that what they were seeing at that point in time with Moses, you have seen something similar created on your TV screens about the aliens out in Area 51. <laughs> and how they glowed. Well, they didn't glow out there, by the way. They weren't even there in Area 51. I'm not worried about that. And if I'm wrong, I'll find out when I get to heaven. But I don't believe I'm wrong on that, but that's okay. Moses' face is glowing, and it is not natural looking. There's something wrong with it. If it was natural, then they would have accepted it, but it's not natural. And they're afraid of him because of this miracle, which is the Lord has done with Moses. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. But whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would take off the veil when he came out. You see the radiance of the glory on Moses' face was minuscule in its glow compared to that of the Lord God Almighty. The Shekinah glory of the Lord resting on the mercy seat. And whenever he came out and spoke to the sons of Israel, what he had commanded, the sons of Israel would see the face of Moses, that the skin of the face, Moses' face shone. So Moses would replace the veil over his face until he went in to speak with him, speaking of the Lord. For the next 40 years, the next 40 years, Regardless of what the Ten Commandments by Cecil B. DeMille shows you, Moses is among the people with a veil over his face because of the glory of the Lord that's shining from his face. Paul even talks about that when he's talking about the difference between what's come with Christ and what happened with Moses because with Moses it's fading. Not saying that his face faded, but saying that the Mosaic covenant faded away when Christ came, and it did. Paul says it like this, such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are adequate in ourselves to consider anything as coming from ourselves, but our adequacy is from God, who also made us adequate as servants of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit, letter of the law of Moses, by the way. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. But if the ministry of death in letters engraved on stones came with glory, and they did, when Moses brought them down, they came with the glory, because the glory was shining on his face, by the way, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory on his face, fading as it was. In other words, that thing has gone away. Mosaic's gone away. It's faded away because the Lord has come. How will the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? The people could not understand the radiance of the face of Moses, but the Lord could. But what Paul's talking about here is the difference between the Mosaic covenant and the covenant of Christ. You see, in that old law, the Mosaic covenant, for instance, with Moses, judgment for 
just three things, adultery, murder, and theft, was all brought upon you because people saw you do the act. But with Christ, the judgment of adultery, murder, and theft, the th same three things, is totally based on your thoughts that only God can see. You see, the Lord coming made the law more difficult, made it stronger, made it stricter. And so as we end the chapter here, I have a, few, I have a question. Just my type of question, just kind of to leave you with a little levity. So when he went home at night to see his wife, did he wear the veil or not? Did his two boys see him without the veil for 40 years? Or did they see him with the veil? It's kind of like those, does he wear that wig at home too? <laughs> Questions? Oh, yes, that's even better. Oh, I need to write that down and add that in. Yes. Oh, a little glow might rub off. I wonder if he kissed his wife over the next 40 years. You remember, she was already mad at him when he was headed over to Egypt in the first place. So we start off the next chapter. Lo and behold, the tabernacle is not even built. The offering has not been even taken. The Lord's brought the two tablets back down. He's given them the commandments. They see the radiance of the glory. The first time they came down, they were in sin. The second time He came down, they were righteous. And now it's time to take the offering. Now it's time to introduce the craftsman. Now it's time to get the tabernacle, the furnishing, and all of His fixtures built so that they can go on their way. And lo and behold... It can be dedicated on the one year anniversary of leaving Egypt. We'll see that in just a few verses. And then they're going to be right up there at a place called Kadesh Barnea, where they're ready to send the spies in. Now, I got bad news for you. Here's the bad news. The story of the spies is not in Exodus. It's over in Numbers. So we don't get to hear about that. In Exodus. But I'll probably tell it to you anyway again. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this time to study your word, listen to you, and realize what a divine God we serve. Thank you for that. In your name, amen and amen.